The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star at its rising, and have come to do him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was greatly troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it has been written through the prophets. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, since from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and ascertained from them the time of the star's appearance. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the child. When you have found him, bring me word, that I too may go and do him homage. After their audience with the king, they set out. And behold, the star that they had seen at its rising preceded them, until it came and stopped over the place where the child was. They were overjoyed at seeing the star, and on entering the house they saw the child with Mary his mother. They prostrated themselves and did him homage. Then they opened their treasures and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their country by another way. The Gospel of the Lord. Today we have the opportunity to celebrate the great feast of Epiphany. Now it should be 12 days after Christmas to celebrate those 12 days of Christmas, but we've moved it to the Sunday, so we only have 10 days of Christmas this year. I kind of feel like we're cheated a little bit of those extra two days, but nevertheless we can still celebrate Christmas, even if we're going to celebrate the Epiphany today, which would end the 12 days, but we can continue to celebrate Christmas throughout the whole season, all the way until February 2nd, the Feast of the Presentation. So I encourage you, don't give up on Christmas just because we're shortened it to 10 days. Embrace this season and let the joy really live and be celebrated in your hearts and in your homes. Today, this Feast of Epiphany is really a feast of light. The prophet Isaiah says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. With these words from the prophet Isaiah, the church describes the content of this feast. Jesus Christ, who is the light, the true light of the world, and by whom we too are made to be light in the world. He indeed has come into the world, and he shines his light to illuminate the lives of those who are in darkness. And he, as St. John tells us, gives us the power to become children of God. Today we consider the, the journey of the wise men from the east. And in our liturgy we can see that they're in procession, just as we are. And that that great procession, which they began, continues throughout history. With the Magi, humanity's procession or pilgrimage to Jesus Christ begins. We journey to Jesus, who the true God was born in the stable of Bethlehem. We journey to, do, to adore Jesus, the true God who died on the cross. We journey to adore the Jesus who, having been raised from the dead, remains with us always until the end of the world. In this gospel account from Matthew, which we 
throughout the world read on this Feast of the Epiphany, we, put it, we pair it alongside with that, prophet, with that prophet Isaiah that we heard as our first reading. That this is a journey of those men of the prophet, that, that the prophet Isaiah spoke of. The Magi become just the beginning of those men who are journeying to Jesus. We could remember in the weeks before, it was the shepherds, those simple souls who dwelt closer to God, who first journeyed to Bethlehem, who were more easily able to go over and to recognize him as Lord. But now, with the Magi, we see it's not simply the simple souls, and it's not simply those loved ones of God, the Jewish people, but the whole world is coming, great and small, kings and slaves, Men of all cultures and all peoples are coming to Christ. The men from the East are the first, followed by many more throughout the centuries. You and I, we place ourselves in their number. And this great prophet Isaiah, this vision which he had, that reading of all nations shall come and adore you, is echoed then in the letter to the Ephesians, in which St. Paul puts it so very simply, he says, I shall let you know that the Gentiles too share in the heritage of the chosen people. And this indeed is good news for you and I. For maybe a few of you are of Jewish descent, but I imagine the majority of us here were not ever Jews who converted, but rather were more Gentile. Those of us who are from all the rest of the nations, who now are welcome to be part of God's chosen people. Welcome to, in, to inherit those promises of God's chosen people. Welcome to become, as St. John said, members of that family, children of God. And so as Psalm 2 puts it, all nations on earth will adore you. And today we consider those wise men who lead the way. They open the path for the Gentiles. They were, as we might study, men of science. But not simply in the sense that they were searching for a wide range of knowledge. Truly, they wanted something more than to simply know how the world worked. They wanted to understand what being human was all about. They, doubtless, they doubtlessly had heard the prophet of the Gentile, the Gentile prophet Balaam, which we could read in our book of Numbers, this Gentile prophet Balaam said, a star shall come forth out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Knowing this prophecy, these men, these magi, these wise men, they explore, explored this, prof, this prophecy. They explored this promise. They were men with restless hearts, not satisfied with the superficial, not satisfied with the ordinary. They studied the world and they knew so much about the world. And yet they were still in search for more. They were in search for a promise. They were in search for God. They were watchful men, observant of how the world worked, of all the signs of nature, capable of reading God's natural revelation. And yet they were still watching, looking to see how God was speaking through the world itself. But more than merely restless, more even than being watchful, they were also courageous and humble. We can imagine they had to endure a certain amount of mockery, setting off to go find the king of the Jews. Imagine yourself telling your neighbors, I'm going on a journey, I don't know where I'm going, and I don't know who I'm going to find, but I think it's pretty important. They had to have been mocked. And yet, courageously, they didn't worry about what the world thought. They didn't worry about what was the opinion of all of their neighbors. For them, it mattered little what this person or that person, what the rest of the world was doing. They had taken upon themselves the sacrifices and the effort in that long and uncertain journey. Off we go 
to find the promise, to find the answer to life's questions. And their humble and courageous effort is what enabled them to continue as they arrive in Jerusalem. With humility, they had to admit, science has only gotten us this far. We need a supernatural revelation. And so they turned to the prophets. They turned to those who could interpret the prophets, the scribes and the Pharisees. And they said, help us. For science has brought us to Jerusalem, but we do not know where to go from here to find the truth of what life is about, to find the king over all nations. They, of course, went to the king of the Jews, Herod, expecting to find the king there. And yet they had to have even greater humility when they were pointed not to the king, but to a humble family, a poor family. And with that courage, with that humility, with their restless hearts, they drew near and they prostrated themselves and they worshiped God, the son of a poor family in a humble home hidden from the wisdom and the powers of the world. They had set forth on their journey, an outward journey, but also, of course, an inward spiritual journey with restless hearts. St. Augustine speaks to us about these restless hearts in his confession. He says all of us have these restless hearts which are ultimately satisfied with nothing less than God himself. And when our restless hearts encounter God, they become loving hearts. For that is what and who and all that God is. Our heart is restless for God, and it remains so, even though so often today every effort is made to anesthetize our searching, to anesthetize our longing and our restlessness, to satisfy us with anything. We go searching to rest our, for our hearts to rest in something, and yet nothing delivers us. Nothing is ultimately satisfying other than God himself, for we are restless for God. But what is so very beautiful is that we hear, we hear and we learn through divine revelation that God is restless for us. That he is searching for us. That he is longing for us. That he is waiting for us. He is looking for us. That he knows no rest either until he finds us. God's heart is restless, and that is why he sets out on a path for the mission of redemption towards us, towards Bethlehem, towards Calvary, to Jerusalem, to the very ends of the earth. In the book of Revelation, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock to see if any will open themselves to me. On the cross, Jesus cries, I thirst. And Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta, in her meditation on that, says he is thirsting for souls. His soul is thirsting to encounter ours, to enter into deep and lasting communion with humanity. For those who are willing to open themselves and respond to his longing, God is restless for us. He is looking for people who are willing to be caught up by him, in him, and through him. His passion is for a people who will carry within them the searching of their own hearts so that their thirst for God can be consummated in his thirst for man, in that intimacy of holy communion. And so this truly then is the task of the church to bring man to God and to bring God to man. This is the task of every priest, to let ourselves as men be touched by God, to be touched by his unrest, by his searching, by his calling out for us. And then in turn, to bring that to the rest of man. So that God's longing for man 
and man's longing for God might be mutually met. We see that in the very, very beginning in today's wise men. Those men who were following the star, it says. Through the very language of creation, they discovered the God of history, the God of creation, the God of the cosmos. To be sure, the language of creation is not enough. Natural revelation is not enough. Science is not enough. But we see how beautiful it is when a man of science entrusts himself to the truth. It brings him so very close. And then if he allows divine revelation to enlighten him, he can take those few steps farther and encounter the Christ child. How absolutely wonderful that we have been given both reason and faith to bring us to God, to speak to our hearts, our minds, our souls, and allow us to encounter the God who is searching for us. Guided by that star, some would say it's a planetary constellation, an alignment of several different stars. Certainly others have thought it might be a very, maybe a supernatural event or maybe a supernova. I'll leave the decision of that debate to the experts. Or you can simply just read Father Saunders' column in the Herald, straight answer on the star of Bethlehem. But if we can take the imagery that Pope Benedict uses of perhaps that star that, that leads us is Christ himself. If it was a supernova, then it's an explosion of God's love into the world, which causes a great light of his heart, the love of his life, to be revealed and to shine upon the world. And these men from the East, Pope Benedict then would, in his meditation, say, who are the, really the protagonists of today's gospel, they become, like all saints, themselves lights pointing to that great light. They become, as it were, a constellation of lights shining forth and leading us to the truth, enlightening our path by which we can shape our lives to make sure that we get where we are going. People, be they the Magi or be they you and I, who allow themselves to be touched by God, to allow their restless hearts to encounter his searching heart, who allow themselves to be enlightened by Christ, the light of the world, become, as it were, lights themselves, shining in the midst of the darkness for others. This is the saints, those lights, those stars of God. My brothers and sisters, you and I too, though, are called to this. This is what it means when we, in our baptismal message, in our baptism sacrament, receive that light, that light from Christ who then enlightens all men. We then are called to be those little stars in the night shining towards the truth. No doubt, it's some of those little stars. You and I could each think of those people in our lives, saints and others, who have led us into this church this day, who continue to point the way out to Jesus, showing us where he can be found, showing us who he is and what he means to us. You and I, though, are called to also be that for others, to let this great feast of light, the light of Jesus Christ, who enlightens all men, shine through our lives to bring ourselves into union with him, but also then through us, that we can join that procession of the shepherds and the magi and all the other nations to come and adore the Lord, not merely now, today in church, but forever. All the nations of all peoples, all times, all places, entering through the church, joining in that great pilgrimage, traveling, on a journey, courageously, humbly, searching for the truth, which can only be found in God, who is light from light, true God, true man, truth itself, the answer to all of our searching hearts.